This House has considered the safety of journalists. Alex Sobel. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Freedom of the press is at the centre of a free society. So I'd like to start by talking about West Papua, whose people have been fighting for self-determination of Indonesia for 50 years. It's in the last month, however, that hundreds of Indonesian soldiers have been deployed to the region, thousands have been displaced, and the Papuan struggle for liberation journalists have become one of Indonesia's key targets. Restrictions in place on foreign journalists as well as obstacles to receiving permission to report in the country. Once again, the prominent West Papuan journalist Victor Mambor was targeted in attack after his reporting on the shooting of two Indonesian teachers in April. Similarly concerning is the fact that the capital of Papua province and surrounding areas have been subject to a month-long internet blackout, complicating the media's efforts to report on the escalating conflict. The curtailment of journalistic freedom in West Papua is not completely new. In 2018, the Indonesian military deported BBC journalist Rebecca Henschke and her co-reporters Dwiki and Afan, who were crew, um, as crew were deported from West Papua after they hurt soldiers' feelings. When covering the ongoing health crisis in the Asmat region, which involved malnutrition and lack, of, and lack of measles vaccinations causing a measles outbreak, killing dozens, maybe hundreds. Due to lack of reporting, we will never know. And according to the Alliance of Independent Journalists in Indonesia, there were 76 cases of journalists having to obtain prior permission to report in Papua, 56 of which were refused. The unacceptable targeting of media officers in Gaza by Israeli airstrikes earlier this month was another reminder of the importance of upholding press freedom. The freedom to inform is a crucial indicator of democracy and efforts to contain it often come with human cost. Anna Politkovskaya was a reporter for the independent Novaya Gazeta in Russia and a critic of President Putin. Like many others, I was shocked and horrified when she was shot to death in the lobby of a Moscow apartment in 2006. The trial into her death, the judge was clear. Politkovskaya, he said, was killed for a work exposing human rights violations, embezzlement and abuse of power. The sad reality is that I would no longer be surprised at such a death. It's estimated that 21 journalists have been killed since Putin came to power. In the great majority of cases, no one has been convicted and sentenced for the murders. That is not to say, of course, that the murder of journalists is a uniquely Russian issue. Many other countries have higher death rates, but in nearly 15 years since Politkovskaya's death, the space for independent journalism in Russia has become smaller and smaller, while state-backed media has grown stronger and stronger. Many independent publications have been forced to cease their publications, while Russian state-backed channels like RT seem immune from accountability. The lack of accountability may or may not be a result of the clear message from Russian authorities. Action taken against RT in the UK resulted in measures being taken against the BBC in Russia, while the Russian media is free to criticise the BBC as it sees fit. Russia is not the only state on a mission to reduce or remove BBC influence. Last month I chaired a joint BGIPU and BBC event on the media in China and heard how the BBC's reporting coronavirus and persecution of the Uyghurs mean that the Chinese authorities have cracked down, removing the BBC World News TV channel outright and banning the BBC World Service in Hong Kong. The BBC's China correspondent has now moved to Taiwan. Because of... I'll give way to, to the member. The Honourable Gentleman and I share uh, our um, uh, concerns for the persecuted and the ethnic mi religious minorities across the whole of the world. Uh, we are aware of them escalating across the world. Does the Honourable Gentleman agree with me that journalists have a role to play to raise awareness, raise issues that are happening in, in Ch China or Russia, wherever it may be in the world, because that's how the rest of the world knows what's going on? Uh a absolutely. The, the, f the freedom of journalist expression is, is absolutely paramount, including in terms of freedom of religion. So absolutely vital points uh, from the member for Strangford there. Um, so, so as I was saying, the BBC's China correspondent now had to move to Taiwan because of safety fears. China's lack of press freedom is well documented. It sits at number 177 out of 180 in the 21 World Press Freedom Index. Only Turkmenistan, North Korea and Eritrea fall below it. In 2020, a year when a historically high total of 387 journalists and media workers were detained worldwide, China was the worst offender. The, the, their record-breaking year saw at least 274 journalists locked up for their work. The UK government must move further and faster to develop an international strategy to prevent journalists, media freedom and internet access from authoritarian tendencies across the globe. And I hope this is something that's being discussed at the G7 today. Of course, the UK is not without fault. The UK is ranked just 33rd out of 180 countries in the 21 World Press Freedom Index. In February, we heard of Andy Acheson, who was arrested at his home after photographing a fake blood protest outside the Napier barracks, where asylum seekers were being housed at the time and still are, even though there's been a High Court ruling against the government. Police held Mr Acheson for seven hours and seized his phone and memory card. 
Ms Aitchison was just doing his job and exercising his right to freely report on the conditions in which asylum seekers are held. Yet he was wrongly arrested and his journalistic material was taken. Still no apology has been forthcoming. The government must do better. And how can we talk about press freedom without talking about the clearinghouse, the Orwellian unit that obstructs the release of sensitive information requested by the public under the Freedom of Information Act? In a written judgment made public on Tuesday, Judge Hughes concluded there was a profound lack of transparency about the operation that might appear to extend to ministers. I look forward to the minister clearing that up for us. As well as blocking FOI requests, the unit is alleged to have profiled journalists. That's such a profound lack of transparency, and it exists at the very heart of government. It paints a very concerning picture. I would also like to take time to reflect on the issue of slaps, which use impunity both in the UK and elsewhere. Strategic lawsuits against public participation and legal actions taken outside, um, taken out not necessarily with the goal of winning in court, but rather silencing the target. Powerful interests wanting to shut down stories can do so by taking legal action, which they know will, cut, will cost the defendant huge sums of money in legal fees and potentially take years to resolve. Slaps can be taken out by individual businesses, state actors, or any other individual or group with enough money to do so. They may target academic freedom, political expression, or more commonly than ever, the freedom of the press. Slaps can kill an uncomfortable story, but they can also have the bigger impact of silencing other critical voices, creating the same culture of fear and silence as through illegal means. The Conservatives talk a good game on freedom of expression, but let's not forget they've been known to exclude newspapers they don't agree with from official briefings. And I hope the Minister can give us some assurances on these points. Thank you. For the uh, former chair of the DC... Those subjects where, in principle, every member of the House can agree, but it's in the detail whether it's here domestically or internationally where we need to scrutinise government action. And the speeches today from members right across the House raised issues where the government must and should do more. So I'd like to thank the, the Chair of the Select Committee, the Honourable Member, folks in Hythe, for his support on SLAPs and for raising issues um, around journalistic freedom in the Philippines, one of the world's most brutal regimes and the need to protect journalists in the upcoming online safety where I'm sure we'll work closely with him on that. The Honourable Member for Argyle and Boots on his comments on a, on a wide range of countries, some of which I, I failed to mention, so I thank him for that, including Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Hungary, where, where Orban has used government media for racist attacks but restricted the free press and in some cases expelled the free press from the country. Israel, which I did mention, as well, and many members mentioned um, Israel in the context of the, of the attacks in Gaza. And I think it was um, no accident that many of the countries that he mentioned have right wing populist governments. And that's something that those governments have in common is the restriction of freedom of the press to be able to um, carry out their agenda. And I wish to associate myself with the, um, the speech from the Honourable Member for Gravesham, whose distinguished journalistic career and pay tribute to those British journalists who are killed for reporting the truth to the world. Also thank my honourable friend and not quite neighbour, the member for, for Leeds East and the honourable member for Hayes and Harlington, who pointed out that destroying the, the AP building in Gaza was about restricting reporting on that conflict. And then they, they went on um, and now they've got a strong record and history in seeking judicial, uh, uh, the fair judicial treatment for journalists facing prosecution related to reporting, and I'm sure will continue to do so. Um, and that my old friend from Hayes and Harrington also rightly praised the NUJ, who fiercely defend the rights of their members, are journalists, whether they're here in the UK or around the world and also the work of Open Democracy, who do a, who do a brilliant job in safeguarding uh, our freedoms here in the UK and holding the government to account. Uh, my humble friend for Belfast South made an exemplary speech and was absolutely right in reminding us that journalists in Northern Ireland continue to receive threats and restrictions on their reporting. The government must do far more to protect journalists in Northern Ireland. The, the murder of Lyra McKee must result in justice and the lessons need to be learned that no more journalists are killed in Northern Ireland. It's, it's vital that we, on our own shores, protect our own journalists. The Honourable Member for Caithness Sutherland and Easter Ross was right to um, highlight 
um, the fact that Amal Clooney quit as the UK envoy in press freedom, as our own government failed to stick to international law. And then the Honourable Member for Auckland South Persia was also totally correct to highlight the horrendous kidnapping of, uh, of the journalist Roman Protasevich, whose only crime was to tell the truth about his country's Belarus's brutal regime. And just, I want to finish by just saying that I hope the Minister in his response will give us assurances that he can and will do more to ensure press freedom, both here, and I, I didn't hear very much in his opening uh, speech to, to, to make me feel confident that he'll do more here, um, but also globally, where he has made many, you know, not just today, but last week and in the past, um, assurances about protecting British journalists and international journalists right around the world so they are free to report. Thank you.